Okay, I think it's it's time for uh, the next session. So I will hand over to Bertrand to, uh, to take you through the presentation. Thank you, Sharon. So uh, welcome to this uh, session. Uh, I can't see you. <laughs> I can't, uh, we can't go for drinks after the session, unfortunately. So that's that's how things are in this, uh, in this special funky year, but it's great to be able to do this presentation and I hope you will enjoy it. I'm speaking to you from Switzerland, from my home office. Uh, I live on Lake Neuchâtel, which is a very nice lake here. Um, it's, a, it's a good place to be. And uh, of course, yeah, I would enjoy travel as well, but that's, that's how it is. So this talk is about open source changes the world, uh, really. Yeah, you know, it's a bit presumptuous to say that, but I think, uh, yeah, open source does change the world in many ways, and I'm going to, to explain a few of them. Um, so I'm, I've been involved in open source since uh, year 2000, I would say. I started in the Apache Software Foundation through FOP. I donated a, a module to, um, to generate RTF documents and the uh, the line at the time was that it was already too late to uninvent RTF. It's a, I don't like that format, but it the, the, you know the tool was useful. And then I I joined the Cocoon project, which was a, was a very nice uh, community. I'll talk about that uh, a bit more. And now the only project that I'm currently active in is Apache Sling, which is a, a web very modular web framework written in Java OSGI. And that I use in my work for Adobe, where I work on the Adobe Experience Manager, which is a large-scale uh, web content management. In the in the ASF, I'm involved. I'm currently on the board of directors. I also mentioned that in the presentation. It's a great way to, you know, see how the function, how the foundation foundation works from the inside and interact with the the great people who are active in it. Uh, I need to be able to change my slide. Yes. So if this is your your view of open source, um, it's <laughs> I would understand it. I suppose I'm kind of probably preaching to the choir here. So you know what open source is about. But I've done this uh, presentation in a in a more general public conference, I would say, and some people will see open source like that. You know, a bunch of hippies uh, sitting on the the edge of the road and not really sure where they're going. Um, if you look at the SF, it's it's not like that. It's uh, or uh, you know, it's the, it's much more serious than that. And though we try to keep the openness and the freshness of those those times, maybe. Um, I the first time uh, I got elected as a as a on the board of directors of Apache was in 2008, and um, some people in my family they were okay, they were excited about it, which is cool. But <laughs> my I remember someone saying, "Oh, Bertrand, it's cool. You're going to have more money. You're becoming director." Uh, no, in you know in the ASF, you we we not get any money actually for being a director. It's all a, it's a volunteer uh, uh, you know task, and uh, so there's no there's none of that. Um, but I would say uh, being a director, being a member of, a, of the Apache Software Foundation has brought me a lot in terms of learning, in terms of meeting great people, in terms of you know, seeing what the fantastic things that people are doing. So uh, it's, been, it's been a great experience. I'm very happy to, 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 you know, to have been able to do it. And, uh, and it's, yeah, it's continuing. It's, I'm on my 11th term now and I still, still enjoy it. But really, it's a, it's about learning. It's about interacting with people. That's uh, that's where I think you can, yeah, hopefully do a good job in in doing that. Um, and I wanted to 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 show you what has happened uh, in my career, um, and and a lot of it or most of it is is directly linked to open source actually. Um, I, bre I became a grandpa a month ago, so I'm, I'm not that young anymore. I'm not that old either, I think. But still, you know, I've been I've been around for a while. Um, 
Uh, and my so if you look on this timeline, it starts in 1998. I was working for the Swiss uh, government at the time, federal chancery, and they accepted. You know, I was working for them as an independent consultant, and they allowed me to create my module in, as an open source project. It was this RTF J4 RTF generating module to generate semi finished documents, and it was fantastic. I think probably they didn't have some some clear rules at the time of whether it was allowed or not, because it was very early. So I said, yeah, OK, it's fine. You can do it. So I put my project up on the SourceForge at the time. And then it was noticed by Janugo Rabelino from Apache. Say, hey, Bertrand, maybe you want to donate that to, to Apache FOP. It looks like it could be useful. So that's how I, how I got started. And then uh, I was already, I've been doing working around content management pretty much all my career. Uh, so, so I was doing that, and I noticed uh, Apache Cocoon, which was a great uh, framework to create dynamic websites uh, in the early 2000s. It's not that popular today, but uh, it still works fine. And it, at, at the time, it was a very innovative framework to do, uh, to do you know, dynamic websites and open source and Apache project. And it, Cocoon was a very nice community in these, these times. It, it's probably still a good community, but it's, it's less active today. But at the time, it was all people from small companies, and we, we were all doing business with Cocoon on, uh, on our own small scale, which meant that we, we really needed to work, and we were very enthusiastic about it. That was, it was a great experience. Then I became a member of the Apache Software Foundation around 2003. And then this nouveau, this uh, this uh, yellow thing here, it's a, a website that I did for the Swiss television, and it's interesting because it it the people who were working on this project found out that uh, Cocoon was a good tool to do that, and they say, okay, we need to find someone who who knows uh, Cocoon, and they look at the list of contributors, list of committers. And there's my name, Bertrand de la Creta. I said, this guy must be from around here with a name like that. So they called me and I got to work. And, you know, I started to work for them for, I think, for about five years, five, six years. I, I worked for them. And this was directly related to Cocoon, you know. So, yeah, open source played a key role as my marketing, I would say, as an independent. Then I got hired by Day Software, a small company in Switzerland doing content management products in 2007, also via the activities in open source, because I had met their CTO at an Apache conference. And, you know, we already knew each other, so it was much easier to, to hire me. That's someone that you, you don't know at all. Then 2008, I already mentioned, board of directors made a big difference about learning things and meeting people. And then Day Software got acquired by Adobe in 2010 because Adobe, Adobe.com was running on our products. I said, oh, we might as well buy the company. And now it's, uh, as I said, Adobe Experience Manager. And then I've also been involved in the Apache Incubator, which I find is a great way you know, to bring, bring new products and new, new people in, in Apache. So really, open source has played a key role in my career. Uh, the graph that you see here is uh, the evolution of the share price of day software. So it, it went pretty well. You know, that doesn't say everything about the company, but it still meant that, you know, the company was doing fine. And day software was really based on open source software. And in the Adobe product that I'm working on, Experience Manager, I would say 90% of the of the critical stuff is, is uh, open source Apache projects. So still a strong... Uh, relationship to that. It's not because I want to, to you know, push me to, bo to, to boast about this, but I think it, it shows that, you know, you can build a solid career on, on around open source. And I think that's great. So open source has changed my world and my professional world uh, through all these uh, experiences. Um, the second point that I want to make is that open source is everywhere. Of course, we as programmers might realize that more than the, the general public. But, uh, you know, when you talk to people and you want to convince them that open source is something serious, you can say, you know, open source is in your fridge. If you have a kind of one of these modern fridge fridges, there's certainly some open source software that, that's uh, involved in that. In your computer, that's obvious. Even th this picture shows a, an Apple Mac. But even though Mac is a commercial product, the, the Darwin, the, the, the core operating software is, is open source. Uh, the electric car on the top right uh, certainly has some open source control software inside it. Your bank might run on open source. There's a fine rack track in ApacheCon. So, you know, software to create microfinancing or, 
or uh, digital banks. So that's uh, banks are software today. So I'm sure they have a lot of open source. The drill, the electric drill, drill is maybe a bit uh, on the edge, but I'm sure that if you look at the supply chain or the, the design software that's used to build these tools, there is, there is open source. The nice building that you see on the right is the Swiss parliament. I, I will mention that because, so I used to work for them, uh, 20 something years ago as a consultant and we did lots of stuff based on based on open source uh, i used one of the very first java web frameworks called nhydra to do a website from them in 90 1997 so it was pretty innovative and again based on open source and we'll see another thing later in the slides about this parliament which is interesting in terms of collaboration methods and the tax software, <laughs> I have a story about that. Uh, so in Switzerland, we have. A, I used to to live in Canton de Vaud, uh, you know, the Vaud uh, county or state, and they have a software called Vaud Tax, which allows you to do your your taxes. And when I got this, I looked at you know, I kind of hacked, not hacked it, but reverse engineered it to see what's what was inside. And they were using Apache Fop. So I looked if they had the, you know, the the credits, if they were get, giving credits to Apache, which you need to do, and they did. Didn't. So I wrote to the to the tax office and I got an answer within one hour, which is very fast for that type of organization. From someone who was a bit embarrassed, say, yeah, you know, we already have distributed 200,000 copies of the software and we forgot, as you said, you yeah, rightly said, we forgot to put the Apache credit for the Apache software. What shall we do? Do we owe you money? And then we we said, you know, the assets said, no, you don't, but please fix that for next time. So people were using open source software without realizing that there might be some strings attached, some things that you need to, to respect when you use it. But really the point I want to make is that open source is everywhere. And it, you could say it runs a large part of our, of our world today. And I'm not the only one saying it. Here you see, uh, you know, so a few quotes. On the on the left, you have Urs uh, Hölzli uh, from Google, who is another Swiss guy, um, and he says, "Open source software has changed everything." And, you know, and this is Google's. You know, this is one of the top people from Google speaking. So, you could say Google is not the more the most open company, but you know, they say open source software has changed everything, and they are very active in open source, even though they, their products have a, are very commercial. So yeah, Google says open source software has changed everything. Top right, we are, you have Justin Ehrenkranz, who uh, a fellow Apache member who was president of the foundation uh, a few years ago, and says, you know, I mean, I'm in a taxi, I'm in a, a cab, and the driver has his car heads up display, and there's a menu that says open source software. We have won. You know, really, yeah, open source is everywhere. And then you have, uh, the, I think the Microsoft story is also interesting. In 2001, you have Steve Ballmer saying Linux is a cancer, which contaminates uh, software with hippie GPL rubbish. And then 2019, you have Microsoft contributing to OpenJDK, and later they go on to buy GitHub and so on. So they have really changed their mind about open source. So it's, you know, more examples that open source is really everywhere and is making a big difference for for those huge uh, companies so the i think yeah we can really say today the hippie gpl rubbish is over if not that it ever existed but uh, you know to to put to kind of make a turn on that on that statement um open source is today is powers things and the so the, the the romantic view of the open source geeks i think is not really valid anymore today and it's really open source communities that make the difference we put a lot of emphasis on on communities in the apache software foundation and i think that's a, that's a really good thing that's really important um so i suppose there's many people in this uh, uh in the audience who know what apache is but if you need to make the point to someone else, that could be useful. Apache is a neutral space. We sometimes say jokingly, it's a Switzerland of open source, but I think it, it does apply in many ways. Um, and it's meant for in the independent projects, projects which are independent from organizations, from companies, where it's really individuals are getting together. And Apache provides a space for these projects to prosper and create. Apache doesn't have a technical strategy, for example, but we provide space and we let the, the projects flourish, do, do what they do, uh, you, you know, what they do best. And the goal is to produce open source software for the public good. 
it's really you know it's really the basics of apache explains many things uh, about how we work and our fierce independence and all these things and the last line it's based on the commercial friendly apache 20 license so again going to the to the hippie uh, uh, image uh, we are business folks uh, you know we 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 interact within Apache as neutral, independent volunteers, but the results are meant to be used in business. And we'll see that this uh, this works pretty well. So I think that makes uh, Apache kind of a fairly unique organization. And, uh, and I think it's good to go back to these basic principles when we disagree on things and or when we have to, to reflect on, on what it is that we do. Um, I was go I was thinking when I when I was reviewing my slides yesterday, I was thinking that this would be duplicated with the state of the feather address that that um, David Nally, our president, did uh, a few hours ago. But it's not because David, in the, I think David in the end didn't show any statistics. So it's also good to reflect on the size of Apache. Uh, these numbers are from last year, so they they're, they're already you know we're already over that, but. Uh, and the, the order of magnitude, you know, more than 6,000 committers, more than 700 members, 200 PMCs, 50, around 50 podlings all the time in the incubator. And you see the, the statistics here, which where it's really growing. It's a, it's a solid thing today, uh, around 300 projects, 50 in the incubator, and lots, lots going on all the time. So I think that's a, you know, that's a very important thing and we have to take care of it so that it continues for yeah 50 years or more as we often say and so uh, as i said for us community is at the core community over code uh, you probably know this uh, statement the, the idea is that if you have bad code and a good community the code will get better if you have great code and a community where people argue and fight all the time it will you know entropy will will jump in and the, the the project will get worse or disappear so it's really we we pay a lot of attention on our communities to nurture them to make sure they're they're solid and and uh, you know work well um and one thing that that people sometimes find surprising is that apache runs without meetings and um, and david was mentioning in the state of the feather address how it's it's impressive how Apache has continued despite the, the COVID, the pandemic. You know, it's been now seven or eight months that we've been uh, we've been uh, you know we had problems with that, which is limiting us in many ways. But Apache is just going along. You know, our projects are still working because we we don't have meetings anyway. We okay if we can travel that's cool, but if we can't, we can be uh, as efficient. And that's a, that's a very nice thing, and that I think that's one of the ways in which open source is changing the world, in in inventing or refining these techniques to work asynchronously, to work remotely, and we you know for us it's uh, it's the day to day. We're totally used to doing that, and I think we can help our, our communities in teaching them to do that. Uh, I don't know if it's how it is in other countries. But in Switzerland during COVID, we have lots of experts <laughs> or so-called experts talking about that on the news and say, yeah, you know, uh, people are doing remote work. So they're using video conferencing all day and then they get tired and it's not efficient. And we say, of course, you know, remote working is not reproducing the office at home. It's working in a different way and we're used to that. So maybe we could could teach you that or we you know explain how we work and one one aspect uh, yeah is that meetings are extremely expensive as well so okay now with covid maybe you can't do meetings so that that problem is solved but uh, when when we go back to to more uh, you know being able to travel more i'm sure people will start doing too many meetings again and maybe you can help them yeah find a balance in that um, this is this statement is from a very nice blog post by Paul Graham called the Maker Schedule, Manager Schedule. I invite you to read it. You have the link here on this slide. Uh, in a Maker Schedule, the half hour, you know, if you have a meeting in the afternoon, it can it can ruin the whole afternoon because before the meeting you think about it, you don't start something because you 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 won't be able to finish it, and and you know I think it's really something that meetings uh, are very different. The impact of a meeting on your schedule is very different if you're on a maker schedule 
or on a manager schedule. A manager, if you if if your work is to be in meetings, then if you have one more, it's one more hour. If you're in a maker schedule, you're creating, you're crafting things. Uh, you have to be very careful on where you where you allow meetings in your in your schedule. So and that's something I think also where the, the yeah the open source world is can be leading because we we used to work without meetings or with a minimal amount of them. Uh, we all have, you know, uh, <laughs> you, you know all the examples of failed meetings. If you search for fun videos about failed meetings on the web, you'll find ton of, tons of them. Forgot to invite someone, you know, it's unclear what the goal is. Uh, nobody's making decisions. People are not prepared. So, uh, you know, there's many ways in which meetings can fail. So if you have a working technique that does not rely on meetings, I think it's very efficient. And then when you can have meetings, it's great for brainstorming, for you know discussions, uh, it's it's fantastic. But if, if they are not the backbone of your collaboration, make things much easier. And that's where you can take uh, you know examples from the open source world. Uh, and what the way we solve this in, in the open source uh, communities is, is with, uh, two main tools i would say i don't care exactly what which tools they are but the, i think it's the type of tool that's important on the left you have a shared and asynchronous broadcast channel taking the example of a marine radio if you're if you use a marine radio um, at least in europe you use channel 16 to call and you use this as little as possible because it will get crowded otherwise. And then you switch to another channel to have a, to have a, the discussion that you want to have with with the you know the port authorities or the coast guard or anyone. And and I think this, a similar model works well in open source, and that's what we're doing. You know, in our projects, uh, we uh, the Apache projects usually have a dev mailing list, development mailing list where you discuss the broadcast things, and then you will switch out to to tickets to jira or get tickets for for the details and that that works very well oh <laughs> i see that for, uh, i left some french commentary here the last version of that of those slides were in french so i'll let yeah, i'll let you translate yeah <laughs> the, the the on the left it says disorganized and noisy on the right it says structured and chronological you know a time based so the the tool on the left is a shared case management tool where you can go deeper in the cases that you're that to, that you're handling be it a, a new feature or a bug or something that you want to do on your on, the, on your project's website or whatever it could be as simple as index cards if you're co-located or, or but you know of course you know in our digital worlds we use digital world we use tools like like ticket management jira or or bugzilla or git or, or whatever works but i think it's important to focus on the on the tool families asynchronous communications channel and case management tool to go into the details I have another presentation on this uh, you have the link here that i did at first them oh the, no the one from first backstage recording is better I also did that at first demo a while ago. So this is on on the really the asynchronous decisions, and I don't know if the open source communities have invented this. Probably not, but we have refined it to a point where it's out day to day and it's very efficient. And I think that's one way in which open source changes the world by you know refining these techniques and making them available to to anyone for any you know I think it can work for any project. It doesn't have to be software. Um, so this is the, um, the the structure of the Apache uh, Software Foundation, the administrative su structure, if you would say. So every project has a has a VP, uh, a vice president who's in charge of interacting between the board of the project and the project. They don't have in general they don't have any special power. They're more here as a as a liaison. And then we have the uh, VPs for different. Uh, administrative tasks like fundraising, travel assistance, marketing, publicity, infrastructure, and so on. Then you have the board of directors. It really looks like, you know, a, a medium-sized company, and that, which is which is what it is in the end with, you would say, with 6,000 employees, uh, if you would transpose that to, to a commercial entity. And the thing is, as I said, it works without meetings or very few meetings. The board of directors has a monthly uh, call, uh, video conference today and actually this is uh, this has been getting shorter this year because we have started to do even more asynchronous work in the in the board of directors so the last meetings have been around 30 to 45 minutes per month so that's not a long time 
you know to to a long meeting time to to make such an organization work so i it, i think it shows the power of this remote asynchronous collaboration and I mentioned the Swiss Federal Council. It's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> I, so I worked for these people uh, more than 20 years ago, and I, it took me a long time to realize that they actually work in a very similar way to the Apache uh, Board of Directors in terms of organizing their meetings. I actually wrote the software that they used to do the agenda for their meetings at the time using this Enhydra uh, Java framework that I mentioned, um, but I didn't realize until like three, four years ago, that uh, it's very similar to to how we work in the in the board of directors in our and in our projects. The thing that they do, um, I think, it's interesting because it shows that these techniques can work without complex digital tools. And the the tools, the the key tools they have to organize their session. So they they have a, a weekly session of about three four hours, where they all get together um, and they make about eighty decisions in these three four hours and that's a lot you know if you had to discuss every decision it would never work it has to be organized prepared lots of preparation uh before the meeting because they, they these are very busy and very expensive you could say uh people so the way they work is they have color coded lists for their agenda they have an orange list which contains as they say uncontested items of business which means i suppose the way it works is that the the the, the the president says, okay, on the page one of the orange list, we have uh, 12 items which we know we agree on. Can can we accept this in bulk? And then, you know, it takes two minutes and you have 12, 12 decisions are made because they've been prepared in advance. Then the blue list is responses to parliamentary requests so where they might need a bit of discussion to agree on the answer that they will give. It takes a bit more time. Then the white list, um, are items that are very important politically, so they are discussed one by one. Uh, probably takes a, a long time, or not necessarily a long time, but more time. And you know the way it's organized. If you if you can't get to the end of the whitelist, at least you have uh, finished all the other ones. So you maybe you you only do 76 decisions instead of 80, but you you're not blocked by something that takes a long time because it's on the whitelist and you take this after the others or you know you prioritize so it's very efficient and then the last list the green list is confid confidential items of business where maybe some people need, need to leave the room or something like that so my point is that by preparing a meeting like that in advance and that's a lot of work that's i don't know it's maybe 100 people who are involved in in preparing this meeting from the various departments of the government but then it allows these very busy people to take uh, ratify 80 decisions in three, four hours. And it's very interesting because again, it's quite similar to the way we work in the board of directors. Board of directors, we have an agenda, which is a single text file in version control, but it's, it's uh, you know, there's lots of parallels. And my point is that, yeah, it's interesting to see the, the, the parallels between these very different worlds using same techniques to be efficient and, uh, you know, to work in, in an in a hybrid way, this meeting from the Swiss Federal Council is not completely asynchronous. Uh, there's a big part that happens asynchronously before the meeting, and then the synchronous portion can be very efficient uh, because of that. And I think we can do the same in our projects, and we we actually very often doing that in open source. So really, I think open source communities make the difference in this world change that I was I was mentioning by by you know refining the refining these techniques, explaining them, and, and sometimes creating tools that make it easier to work with these uh, with these techniques. Uh, I also mentioned that I think open source is also changing the business world. So how about that? Um, if you look at, for example, at the statistics of the public service on the internet, those statistics are very hard to make because what, you know, now today with everything being virtual and containers and virtual machines and stuff, it's very hard to, to get, a, get a realistic figure. But if you look, uh, this is from Wikipedia, again, from last year, I think, um, it's between 35 and 96% of servers on the web, which are Linux. So, you know, even one of the open source uh, systems is uh, at least 35% or at best 96% depending on how you count. So it's, you know, it's a big part of the web that runs on, on open source. Uh, top right, you have the um, 
the web server software uh, and between Apache and Nginx, according to this statistic, to this Netcraft statistic, it's 51%. So again, a uh, very uh, uh, high uh, percentage of open source in these in these servers, which make the world and make the business run, you know, so it, it is a very important part. On the bottom left, I have an article from uh, Reuters Plus on the, the Hadoop market in 2018. So, yeah, no, probably it's changed today, but to, to you know, Hadoop was um, a market that, that started from nothing and got to, in 2018, was a, a $1,700 million market and growing. So uh, even if it, I don't know if it's still as popular today, those things are, are often changing. But uh, we see that some of our projects uh, uh, from Apache and from other organizations have really created businesses and created industries on a fairly, you know, fairly big scale. So I would say that's that's part of my statement that, that open source changes the world. It changes the business world as well. And in this way, uh, I think the Apache software license is fantastic because of its of its business friendliness and of its clarity, you know, between what's what's the open source free stuff and what's uh, how you can do business with it. Another way in which open source makes a difference is in talent discovery and hiring. Uh, you're probably aware of the, the student programs which are around open source. Uh, Google Summer of Code might, might be the, the most well known. And every year you have thousands of students which are involved in this program and can get in touch with open source projects. I know personally some of them who got jobs at Google, at uh, uh, TypeSafe, and you know so, some serious companies coming from countries where it might be harder to get a job because they were they were good and they you know they they could uh, start showing their talents uh, in an open source projects via these programs. And I think that that makes also a difference in the world, in this, these people's lives. And today also, if you look at the, on the right, the GitHub statistics on a project, you can learn a lot about someone. Oh, Smarter Clayton, this person has been, you know, very active in this project from 2015, a bit less after that. And then you can look at their code and see, you know, or, or in your, if you're in the same project, you will know how they interact with people. And it's much easier to make a hiring decision based on that. So I think that's also one angle where, where open source makes a big difference in business, in people's lives through, you know, helping them get good jobs and, and all that. So to conclude, I have three um, key points that I wanted to make. So open source is everywhere, as we said, in your fridge, in your electric bike, in your CD player, in your phone. Uh, you know, if we turned off open source today, we'd be in trouble. I think it might it would, would be even worse than COVID. Um, and open source communities make the difference. You know, we, we have developed some very nice techniques of collaboration in the communities, asynchronous work, interacting in writing, uh, you know, in a decent way, trying to be diverse, trying to be egalitarian uh, and so on. So I think that can have a big impact on people's lives and the way people do business or the way people run projects. And open source is also good for business. We've seen that it powers a large part of the internet. It powers some industries. It creates some industries sometimes. So I think we can really be proud to be to be involved in open source. If you're starting up, I encourage you to, you know, continue and learn more and be more involved in projects, in conferences, and that that will be will be very useful. And I hope these uh, these these this presentation can can help you, you know, make points to convince people or explain to your family what it is that you're doing. You know, sitting in the evening in front of a camera and talking to people. What's that? Um, I think you know it can be helpful for us to be able to better explain what we do. So I hope this uh, this presentation has been has been useful. Um, I can stay in the, if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat now and I can stay for a few minutes or I'll be around the conference and uh, um, yeah, you have my Twitter handle at the bottom of the slides, Pedro Lacreta, you probably have to <laughs> copy paste it, but uh, that's a good way to to reach me. Thank, thank you for being here and I hope this has been useful. And uh, the community track is continuing. So you can, I think it's probably Daniel Ruggeri who's next. So I encourage you to follow this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bertrand. So um, if you have any questions for Bertrand, then please uh, type them in the chat. Uh, and if, uh, 
and so we can relay that to him. If you uh, haven't got any 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 questions, then as uh, Bertram mentions, he will be around the conference, and we can maybe uh, catch up with him uh, a bit later if you think of something that you wanna you wanna ask. Okay. So it looks like there's no question, no immediate questions, but uh, oh, <laughs> thanks, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, we some something something that's what we do, and sometimes sometimes the quality is not much better than the garbled <laughs> sheep radio, which makes you know makes it a challenge to communicate. Thank you. Okay. Nice. So if we if we don't have any any other questions. Then, uh, then, oh, here, oh, I've got something. Here we go, from Adam Taylor. What's a good project to start with if I've never done any open source? I think a good project is one that you need. You know, find something that, I don't know, if you're into music, find a, find a project that does music or, you know, find something that's one of your hobbies or that you need for your work. I think that that's where, where you'd be really motivated um, to 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 do something, and then you have to look at the at the project's community. You know, try to get a feel for how they interact. Do you understand what they're saying? Uh, are they nice to each other? Can they can they respectfully disagree and and all these things? But for me, the key is really yes, something that's useful to you, and then that's that's when you you will be motivated. Hope this answers your question. That's great. Okay. I'll just give him a few more seconds to see if there's any other questions coming through. Okay, no, so nothing's coming through. So um, once again, thanks very much, Bertrand. That's a great presentation. And a reminder for people that everything is being recorded so you can watch it again uh, later. Well, they'll be published on the, the YouTube channel. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, take care. And, thank uh, you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.